少，因灵寻，卡耶伊拉灵，阿萨卡哈拉灵，扎卡拉灵，少爱灵灵寻。Namaste. So I'd like to make a few comments on the second chapter of the first book of Shrimad Devi Bhagavatam. There are some terms and some concepts in there that are very important for your comprehension and understanding. So the first is that Sutta Goswami says that this Purana, this Mahapurana, the greatest history, historical narrative, the Devi Bhagavata, is the greatest of the Agamas. What is an Agama? Well, it's defined in the Sanskrit dictionary as a traditional doctrine or precept, or a collection of such doctrines, a sacred work, or anything handed down and fixed by tradition as the interpretation of a text. So in other words, these are not things that are written down specifically, but they're handed down by traditional usage among the enlightened sages. So the Agamas are, remember we studied the beginning of Maha Nirvana Tantra? And in there, Shiva says, that in the Kali Yuga, the uh, Vedas don't give salvation. Only the Agamas do. So in other words, one has to be initiated into this secret tradition, this esoteric teaching, which is handed down by realized souls to their disciples. Otherwise, in Kali Yuga especially, there's no chance of getting liberation. Now, another idea that he says is uh, that this Bhagavatam, Devi Bhagavatam, is studied and praised by the Munindras. Who are the Munindras? Well, Indra means the king, the heavenly king, and Muni means a sage. So the, the sages of the kings, or the kingly sages, huh? or the kings of the sages, the greatest sages of all, praise the Devi Bhagavatam because it gives all the secrets of liberation. And then he goes on uh, to describe rasas. And I mentioned this last time, and I'm going to mention it again, that the science of rasa is discussed in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Bhakti means spiritual love. Rasa means transcendental emotion. Amrita means nectar, that which gives deathlessness, immortality. And Sindhu means an ocean. So the ocean of the transcendental sentiments that give ecstasy to the devotees are discussed in this book. And in the description, I've put a link where you can download it and study it yourself, which you very much should do. Now, we've been hearing these Puranas for many years, actually since 1972, when my Adi Guru began to publish the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, which is different from the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam. It was the first Purana major Purana to be published in English. And it is also set in the forest of Naimisharanya. Well, what does Naimisharanya mean? Huh? Has anybody ever looked that up? Well, it's very interesting. As it happens, there's a history, uh, again, in the oral tradition, that Shiva vanquished a huge army of demons in this forest, in the twinkling of an eye. 
And what's the word, Sanskrit word for the twinkling of an eye? Nimi. Nimi. And so naimi is the possessive form of nimi. And Isha is another name for Shiva, short for Ishwara. And Aranya means a forest. So the Naimi Isha Aranya, Naimi Sharanya, is the forest where this pastime occurred long, long ago. But it still retains the name even today. Then he says that the goddess is called in the Vedas Vidya. Vidya is a word that means knowledge, learning. Uh, and of course, Saraswati, one of the expansions of the Devi, is the goddess of learning. But more than that, the Vedic knowledge has many divisions. The four Vedas, the six Vedangas, the Puranas, the Mimamsas, Nyaya or logic, Dharma or law, the four Upavedas, and the 64 arts and sciences. Now, as it turns out, this Vidya is also personified as Durga, Mother Durga. And Mother Durga, I live right across the street from a, a temple of hers, and she's very kindly giving knowledge <laughs> just by the repetition of her name. And uh, she is also the author of many powerful prayers and mantras. And so uh, she is personified knowledge, Vidya. Then he mentions the Yoga Nidra. Yoga Nidra is actually Turiya, the fourth state of consciousness. And Vishnu, when he has no duties, when he has nothing to do, especially during the pralaya, the, the devastation, he lies down on the snake Anantashesha in the ocean of milk, or the causal ocean, and he goes into this yoga nidra. And yoga nidra means that which is beyond all the three states of consciousness waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. That's Turiya. Turiya means the fourth. It's the fourth state of consciousness. And this is the transcendental state. It's functionally identical to moksha, or liberation. So this is the state that he was in. And it's sort of like half meditation and half sleep. It's a wonderful state, an extremely pleasant state very restful and recharging for the mind and body and spirit. And it also is a state, because you're not identified with the body, that gives full facility to the exercise of mental and spiritual power. So it's just very valuable. This is really the state of samadhi. This is what we're all shooting for. Oh, and also Vishnu's Yoga Nidra is also personified as Goddess Durga. And we'll read later on, when Brahma is attacked by the demons, he has to pray to her to leave Vishnu's body so that he can wake up and help Brahma defeat these demons. Then he describes the ocean that Vishnu sleeps on as the Ekarnava. Ekarnava means the one ocean. Uh, we see on the earth here that there are several oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, Indian, and so on. But after the dissolution, there's no more land. There's only one ocean. And that's all that's left. This is the causal ocean. It's not an ordinary ocean. It's a subtle ocean. And this is the one ocean from which everything is born and into which it merges at the time of dissolution. And he also mentions Shiva. 
with a long A at the end. Now, this is another reason why you should study Sanskrit. Huh? The difference between Shiva and Shiva is the difference between the Lord, male Lord Shiva and his female counterpart, uh, Devi or Shakti. So uh, the difference is only in the length of the final vowel, Shiva and Shiva, same word. It's also the form of Shiva, uh, which is created by Shakti. In other words, the form of Shiva is not Shiva. Shiva has no form. But there's a placeholder form, a Maya Shiva, which is created by Shakti for the purposes of pastimes. And that's revealed in the uh, Lalita Sahasranam, right at the end. The good stuff is always at the end. Same with these videos, by the way. Then he describes <coughs> Shakti as Turiya Chaitanya. Well, we already discussed Turiya. And what is Chaitanya? Chaitanya is consciousness. So she is the fourth state of consciousness. Huh? Yes, there's the metaphor of the goddess with a female form and doing so many pastimes. But her real nature is Turiya Chaitanya, the fourth state of consciousness. And we should keep this in mind that there are actually two narratives running in parallel here, the metaphorical one and the functional one. So in the metaphorical narrative, there's all these fancy names, and we're going to look them all up and give you the meaning so that you can cut through the symbology of the metaphor to the functional truth. And that's how you become enlightened. Then, oh, he also mentions the Manomaya Chakra. Well, we talked about five bodies in the series on uh, Ramana Maharshi's books. The five bodies are the Anamaya Chakra, uh, sorry, Anamaya uh, Kosha. Kosha means a shield or a sheath. So the Anamaya Kosha is the food body, this gross body, the meat body. Then there's the Pranamaya Kosha, the energy body, which is composed of chi or prana. And then there's the Manomaya Kosha, the mental body, the Vijnana Maya Kosha, the causal body, or the intelligence body, and the Ananda Maya Kosha, the bliss body. This is the body that you realize when you become self-realized. <laughs> so he says, Brahma gave the yogis a, a wheel, a Manomaya Chakra. Chakra means wheel. A Manomaya, a wheel made of mind. And he said to roll this wheel until the felly breaks. The felly is the rim of the wheel. It's an old English word. So how do you roll a wheel that's made of mind? Well, of course, we do it all the time. That's the wheel of samsara, the wheel of birth and death, reincarnation, and so on, karma. So you roll that wheel until you find a place where the rim breaks and you can't roll it anymore. And that's the place where Kali, of Kali Yuga fame, has no influence. He can't enter there. So that's the place where the sages performed their thousand-year sacrifice of hearing from the Puranas. And finally, he talks about Tattva Jnana. Tattva Jnana means knowledge and realization because jnana is not simply book knowledge, that's vidya. But jnana means actual realization of tattva. And what is tattva? The categories of the truth. So we've talked a lot on this channel about ontology and how ontology is 
a system of categories, related meanings, that allows us to describe our experience to ourselves and actually facilitates consciousness as name and form. And name and form is very prominent both in the Buddha's teaching and in the Vedas as one of the stages of manifestation. Without name and form, it's impossible for us to be conscious of something. If we don't have a name for it, if we don't have a description for it, if we don't have a form, in our mind as a model, we can't really be aware of something. That's why I go deep into the definitions of the terms, because the terminology is really the key to understanding how to apply this knowledge and turn it from vidya into jnana. So that's it for today. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.